Hello and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time to preview another Knicks matchup. This time, the season finale, the regular season finale against the Chicago Bulls for the third time in the last eight days. The New York Knicks will take on the Chicago Bulls. The Bulls have nothing to play for and a couple guys are not going to play, but it looks like their, their healthy roster will be available. We'll see for how long. There's one player on the Knicks injury report for this game, and it's Julius Randle, who had a successful uh, surgery on his shoulder earlier in the week. Best of luck to the sergeant on his road to recovery. Shout out to the fine folks at Unified Healing. Uh, but I want to do something, spe- something special. I don't want to talk about the Chicago Bulls. I wish them well in the plan and hope we never see them again. Um, but I wanted to do some kind of crossover. I thought the best way to wrap up a full season of pregame pods is to talk to somebody else who knows what it's like to do a full season of pregame pods. My good friend in the pregame, my partner in the pregame from Knicks Fan TV, Mr. Alex Chateris. Alex, how you doing, buddy? Andrew, my guy, Claudio, what's going on, man? I'm feeling good, man. How are you doing today? I'm good. I should say I follow you on all the socials and you just ran like a 5K this morning, right? Like I did run a 5K this morning. Congratulations. (laughs) Well done, sir. (laughs) Thank you, man. I'm happy about it. You know, no no bragging. uh, 21 minutes and 33 seconds. I did that damn thing. And, you know, just trying to get to some road racing, man. I think last year I... Technically, yes, last year in November, I did a half marathon to you. You found me on that, too. So, yeah, man, just trying to get out there, man, trying to stay fit and active because, you know, got a son. He's moving around and I want to try to stay fit for him. So, yeah, man, just I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you brought that up today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Man. Yeah, Thank you. Man. One of the last things I saw before I like started doing <laughs> prep for this was like, oh, let me see what Alex updated his story. Oh, you ran a 5K this morning. That's awesome. I um. I watched the Mets and and the and the Rangers. That was that was my very chill day to try and detox. Hey. Well, the Knicks had a day off, um, but uh, we're all doing things on our day off to try and stay sane for that mu- for that much. And it's been a long season, and we're at eight, game eighty two. And I wanted to start this specifically because there's really only one other person in this world that knows my pain about trying to do a full season of pregame pods, trying to book guests, trying to you know, do some type of preview of the other team for, for Knicks fans and do it at a, at a quality level. And that's you. And I've, I've we, we use people don't know this. And I, I love when people do think we might be competition that it's like, Oh, you, you guys booked the same guests. Like we both had Trevor Lane and that was a, that was a fun morning. We're, <laughs> we're both like texting each other. Like, Hey, d- did you get a, guest for this person? Do you mind if I reach out to that person? I don't do it as good a job as I should. I will blame the busyness of Nick's film school for that. But uh, if you, as you've come to the end of a full season of pregame pods, um, I guess my first question is going to be your big takeaway from how the rest of the league feels about the Knicks and what they've done this year. Um, big takeaway is that they are impressed with how the Knicks have performed this season, even mm-hmm. with all the injuries. So what we're seeing is not different from what other fans are seeing. So there's a, there's a mutual level of respect now for the New York Knicks that, you know, we've been fans for this team for God knows how long. And there hasn't always been that respect for the New York Knicks. You know, teams would come through to Madison Square Garden or they just, just see them on the schedule in general. It's like, oh, this should be an easy win. You know, if you're a big betting fanatic, you're like, hey, well, the Knicks cover, that's all I really care about tonight rather much than the win. But, you know, now it's at the point where especially with Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle on this team, they respect the Knicks. They look at them as legitimate competition and a measuring stick to see where they are. And even when not fully healthy, it is still a measuring stick for opponents to say, hey, can we keep up with a team that, you know, on a night-to-night basis is going to give 120% because they're just that gritty. So my takeaway is, for most of the people I've spoken to this season, they respect the Knicks. Even when it comes to the Miami Heat, they respect the New York Knicks. But so, wh- how do you feel? How, did you get that same vibe this season? 100%. And honestly, it started a bit last year when people were like, oh, the Knicks. That's a that's a good story. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw my questions about them in the playoffs. Yeah, it was a like, good story, right? It's like a good they're story. overachieving. Oh, that's cute. They're a five seed. And like I'm using the word cute on purpose. Shout out to Giancarlo down in Miami, mm. who was like, oh, Jalen Brunson. Yeah, that, that, that's cute. And then he almost forced the game seven against this team <laughs> in the playoffs. And then this season, he might finish top five in MVP, which I'll, I'll ask you about later. I think the... 
going into this year, it was, can they replicate it? Will they just take a step back? Will they regress a little bit? The East is better. And then after the trade, it felt like, I don't know if you, if you felt this because of like, we kind of like you're asking everybody the same question and you're hoping for different responses, but it's become the same response that it's like, Oh, you're a conference finals contender. Oh, you can probably beat Boston. Oh, this is the OG Ananobi experience. You know, that can Julie, well, can Julius Randall get back healthy? That's the question. Oh, can you, how far can you get? Well, probably the conference finals at best. I would probably still pick Milwaukee. Um, but to the point, there's no LOL Knicks anymore. Like the effort level that comes, the, the base level effort that you get has, I, I, it's a buzzword, but has really established a culture here that, I mean, look, this is, I don't know if this is the best Knicks team I've ever rooted for. Like I do have a hint of the 90s that I still got to enjoy and I still have mm-hmm. an affection for a team that was also a two seed. Um uh, I think that's the toss up at this point with the way Brunson's playing and, and just how good the East has been uh, with that 2012 13 team. But man, I, I just, I look at this season and I think this is the year that people just established like, Oh, that's a, that's one of the most well-run organizations in the NBA, which I think is the, the, the takeaway is that it's no longer just a cute story. It's now a legitimate, like developed thing and I think, I mean, I'm sure you felt this at the reaction to both trades being like at the first time be, it, it in the, in the moment, it was like, oh, that's, that's a lot to give up. That's going to be known as the quickly trade. But then seeing what OG was, it's like, oh, but like, look what they've become as a result. And then the mm-hmm. second one, regardless of how it's turned out, <laughs> um, which I have some questions for how things have gone at Fan TV. Oh, boy. Um, the second one, the big text I was getting from from other people or, or reactions from other people is like, they haven't given up a first this year. They like completely right. revamped their roster and haven't given up a first this year. And I wonder, like, are you getting that same, like, this isn't just like the Knicks are good. This is like, oh, they're actually really competent in the way that they've built this thing, right? Oh, for sure. No, it's that, you know, when you look at how this team is just moving left to right, north and south, whatever direction you want to call it, is that Every decision is made with a purpose and with an intent to like, how are we building around Brunson, Julius? Like, what type of pieces do we need to add to this roster to make it just look fluid, right? And with the OG and Anobi trade, you saw just that. I mean, look, I love Quick, RJ, you know, those guys were awesome for, for this team and they did a lot for this team. But the fit, as we all saw, and I'm sure you would agree that it was a little, it was a little muddy that time because... Those four players between Brunson, Randall, RJ, and Quickly, they all needed the rock in their hands and just to be effective. Well, you remove two of those guys who need the rock in their hand, and now you insert a guy who is very good off ball, solid cutter, can knock down open threes, plays top end defense, right? And now you're like, okay, this is different because now you just allow Julius and Brunson to be who they are naturally. You help Randall by saying, you don't have to take the toughest front court assignment. We got OG. He he mm-hmm. can do that for you. So it's like now Randall gets to focus on a lesser like defensive op- uh, offensive opponent, right? When he's on that on the defensive side, and then you say you can just maximize your offensive talent now. And we saw that in January, which is why they went fourteen and two. And so like when you see that, you're like, oh, this is that was a smart move by the front office. You felt like you gave up a lot, and you did give up a lot because you gave up two guys who are now flourishing in Toronto, but it was for a good cause, right? Because that starting five with Isaiah Hartenstein is legit that that team is legit i wish we could see that this postseason now yeah. when you say when you say when we go to that second trade right the burks and boyan trade and like even though it's just you know slapped us in the face silly mm-hmm. uh it's like you still get the idea of what they were trying to do we need a shot creator and we got two guys who could create their own shot boyan doing a little bit more or so in the last couple of games but you know, the thought process was there and you didn't give up first rounds as you talked about. And I think that's very important to notice that for the GMs that we've seen in the past, like take this first, take that first, take this first. Oh, hell, take everybody. Mm-hmm. Okay. We just want this. I mean, I know we, I you do the metal trade 10 out of 10 times, but like when you look at that type of trade and you're like, did we really have to give up everybody to get that? You still do it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not questioning, but I'm just saying like, when you look at trades like that, and then you're seeing what we're doing now. And we're still creating a competent roster that's competitive and has a chance to be second in the Eastern Conference. You're like, yo, this, this team is moving smart and this team's playing tough. 
the Knicks are a legitimate organization at this point. So the let me just start here at the mellow trade because it's in my DNA to defend it. But I know I know you're not even like I'm not even attacking. I'm just saying, I know like, you're you, not. I, you're just looking at it on paper, right? I'm just saying like you look at right. it on paper and like you're just been scorned by all the other trades that get to it. And it's like it's the most recent trade that we can go back to where it's like you could feel like you gave up a lot to get what felt like a very short return. And this is where I'm going to go with the it's it's more a compliment of this front office. Like that front office that did the mellow trade does the Donovan Mitchell trade. And the Knicks probably win a ton of make, ton of, ga- ton of games, but maybe mm-hmm. they're shorthanded. Like last year in the playoffs for the Cavs, we looked at it and they were like a guy or two short, which is why the Knicks were able to defeat a team that was better than them. Kind of like the Pacers were able to defeat a team that was better than them, the Knicks in 2013. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that mellow team got really old really fast and just had a really incompetent set of ownership in place, which is why the Bargnani trade is, I think, the thing we're all more frustrated than the mellow trade. Mm-hmm. But what this front office has done, and it it helps when Jalen Brunson comes on a very cheap deal and becomes a superstar, but like this front office didn't make the Mitchell trade and played things out in a much more patient way. So where we are, this team is a win away from being a 50-win team and potentially a two-seed. And my gosh, the the way that they're set up for this to be a sustainable long-term run where you're just adding pieces here and there. Like that that 2013 team didn't have a, a Josh Hart that they got for a lot of reprotected first. That's just like a winning basketball player. You got these additive pieces like Isaiah Hartenstein and Dante DiVincenzo breaking three-point records and you know, Deuce McBride developing into what he did and cheap contract for what McBride's doing right now. I mean, they're all kind of they don't have a max contract on this roster. You know, they haven't they've yeah. created one first. It's Josh Hart, and they 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 created this roster that mm-hmm. is all cheap, you know. So I yeah, I I it's not even a, a, a defense of the mellow trade. It's like that that front office clearly had one move, and it was that. Like they were they were telling Dolan for three years we're gonna get a superstar. They traded anything that could walk, uh, or that wasn't bolted to the floor, um, <laughs> like for three years. Like I remember waking if up. They could one take morning, the McDo- if they could take it, the Mickey D's stools out of some restaurants that are they bolted, would have. They, they probably would have. Yeah, quite literally, they might have just they tried, and the guy's bolted to the floor. We can't. We well, we're we can't have, we'll leave this, this here. Tough. But Zach Randolph and and Jamal Crawford, you can go. Um, and it was like set up for one off season. And then like when that didn't happen, when LeBron and co went to Miami, they, they decided they would pull the trigger six months later because they were tired of missing out. So I, I look, I, I just, I, I can't, it, it's not even so much a defensive mellow. It's just like a more, it's a bigger appreciation of what they've built here. And I think to the way this convo started, I think the league is recognizing that these are not your, uh, your 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 uncle's Knicks, your your father's Knicks, your grandfather's Knicks of old that were impatient. Now maybe it has something to do with this globe in Vegas that Dolan's paying more attention to, and maybe <laughs> <laughs> that's just where his focus is at the moment. I mean, but, a sponsor, right, of of the Knicks, <laughs> right? So, like at this point, that's that's he's a music guy. He wants to put on a show, and and it helps when the Knicks are putting on a show every night. I got to ask you about Alec Burks. Because I know oh. that's a CP thing. And I was in the camp of let's be patient. But for the Knicks fan that may not have time to watch both and be aware of what's going on at Knicks Fan TV with Alec Burks, right? Um, so CP has... how is he still defending him? Is oh, no, no, point. no. It is okay, far, so that turned. That officially turned. Point. Okay. It is far it. away. Like, you bring it up now, he's like... It's not happening. Like he, mm-hmm. he, he's owned it. He accepts it. And look, man, all I just want to say is CP. I know you're tuning in somewhere out there. I won that debate, uh, obviously. So, <laughs> well, uh, at the end of the day, I don't know what we were discussing at that point. I told you he wasn't doing his job. He's still not doing his job. So, but yet CP has had this sick obsession with coordinating our guy Tyler. Shout out to Tyler to always clip a Burke's bucket and post it on it. social. And I'm like, what are we I doing here, it. man? <laughs> so have, so, have some dignity. What are we doing here? But hey, man, it's it's over. The Burke's thing, like, and I know I know you got Benji on, on this side who's a big Burke's guy as well. So, well, hey, so man. Real quick, that was it was actually a funny development that the last 12 games of Burke's in Detroit he was awesome. And Benji was like, oh, that's a hooper. And like in the moment, we were like, oh, Benji, they got your guy back. And it actually, Benji was on your side. He was like, these Pistons are not 
part of the culture. These are not the guys that were part of the plan of just surrounding Brunson with defense and point of attack. And like, that's what Grimes was. He was a shooter. Now it helped that Juice McBride developed into something we all wanted Quentin Grimes to eventually develop into, um, which is why I think Alec Burks is going to be out of the playoff rotation. But that became a Macri versus Benji thing that I love Alec Burks. I hope he never plays basketball again. And De- Macri was like, I, I believe in this trade. I think they're, they're, they're going to be good when they come back. And Bogey, I think, has started to give us hope that now that he's surrounded yes. by OG, you can play him with Mitch. It's almost, you know, it's not the same because Brunson's a superstar, but it's the same concept of like, if you surround Bogey with OG and Mitch or Hartenstein and Josh Hart and or Deuce, like you're just surrounding a poor defensive player with a lot of good defensive players. And he could just be really good on, on offense in the second unit. Um, but yeah, that, that did not no, go as planned, this Alec Burks thing, you know? So it didn't. And, and I mean, look, like I said, the thought process was at that time is that you get two guys that could score in isolation, right? Burks doesn't fit what we're trying to do here. I mean, and the thing is like, and I said this on a post game, it's like, he looks like a cartoon at times, man, just like meandering down, like the court and he just like throws up some random shot i just need to hear the do, 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 like every single time is like he's like <laughs> winding up to like barrel down the lane and it's just like no we don't need that man it's like and every time that he takes a shot and maybe he needs an offseason right maybe he needs an offseason to get into rhythm and figure out what to do around here and just completely wipe that stench of just pistons basketball off but it just it, everything he does is just so out of rhythm for what this team's trying to do that i feel bad but the reality is that you're not doing what we need you to do so it's like we can't have you out there because you're hurting more than you're helping. And that's just the reality of it. I mean, every time we watch it, it's like, it just hurts more than he helps. The thing with Boyan is what you said though. It's like you surround him. And the thing that he offers though, is like, he has like a height difference. Even when you play about any position, right? He could shoot, mm-hmm. shoot over somebody at least. And he's been a legitimate starter at some point in his career throughout the league. So you can rely on that saying, okay, at this point of his career, he can at least be a bench guy. And he's shown you in these last couple of games, like, he may still have something in the tank because of what you said. We put him next to OG, Mitch, McBride, Josh Hart, like those guys, even Dante when he's out there, it's like, it just looks better, right? Because you have guys who are like, all right, whether it's Dante, it's like, okay, I know how to jump the passing lanes. McBride, great perimeter defense. OG, anywhere on the court, he's going to lock somebody down. Mitch, awesome rim protector. Same thing with Hartenstein, like solid rim protector, right? So- solid guy to protect the paint. And it's like, okay, man, you take on the weakest, you know, offensive opponent. And, and just go to work. And that's what we're going to ask you to do because when you see Josh Hart, he's going to be crashing. McBride's going to be trying to knock down threes. Uh, Dante's going to be trying to knock down threes. Mitch, if you get to lob, Hartenstein with a floater, like it all just makes sense at the end of the day. Yeah. The uh, the funny thing for me, going back to just like doing the pregame pod, and I'm, I'm curious if you felt this, but people saw the Knicks do that trade and then was like, oh, that's a good trade. And they just didn't check back. I was in, in that camp. Well, so like I'm saying nationally, like people saw that trade and yeah. like I was in that camp too. And it's like, oh, that's a good trade. Right. And then didn't watch the Knicks for the next month and a half. They just assumed, oh, that's a good trade. Like every, <laughs> anytime we see Bogey, he's making shots like Knicks fans must love him over there. Then they come on our shows and they're like, oh, yeah, Bogey, that's a good pickup. I'm sure like you. And then we're just like, no, no, it's awful. They've been awful. And like, have you been able to enlighten people as to or have you had to? enlighten people as to how horrible the Detroit Piston experience has been. You know, I think I had to do that like two, three times. Okay. And like after the trade, it wasn't as, it wasn't as frequent. Um, but the thing is that shout out to my guy, James Ham, who covers the, the Kings. He writes for the, the Kings beat.com. And he's also a radio host for ESPN out there for the Kings. And he was like, Oh, Burks. He's like, oh, never do a mid season trade for Burks. He's like, <laughs> he's like, if you want to see really bad numbers, go look at go look at when Burks was on the Kings. He's like, you do not want to see those numbers. You do not want to see those highlights. Mm-hmm. It's like, if there's a if there's a level of, like he was really was like, no one wants to see this type of basketball. So to me, it just seems like that's why I said like maybe it's a guy who just needs an off season to get acclimated with the team. And I mean, he was starting to get acclimated with the Pistons, right? And even for how bad they were, it's like, ah, if this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. I don't really got to care. But like for the Knicks, it's much different, right? You got to play defense. You got to be tough. You got to play within what the offense is, which is like looking for the best open shot, 
making sure you can attack the lane, which makes sense in what the defense is giving you. So I'm just like, I don't know, man. Like I feel bad for him, but at the same time, it's just like it's just, I, it's just comical at this point because me and Sipa were just like it was always a debate, and then you had the you had the clip, put him in the trunk. And it's like, <laughs> shout out to the lady that called him. She's like, put him in the truck. It's like, wow, this is getting dark. It was like, we, we, we're not trying to kill people here. We're just, you know, we're just upset. <laughs> JD had the tweet of the year, the day of the, the earthquake here in New York. And CP <laughs> sent out something like, you know, what was that? Like my whole house shook. And JD goes, that was Alec Burks's bricks being thrown at your house. And I just, <laughs> I, I laughed legitimately out loud for like five minutes. Bro, that I... <laughs> I lost it. Like I was just, I was in my office. I was just like, I could not stop laughing. You know how like you look crazy. Like when you're laughing to yourself, like, and you're mm-hmm. just like saying like, no one can understand what the reference is. What and you the can't give the context. Is. You, yeah. You can't yeah. Even get, it's like, if I try to give you context, it's a whole, it's like a whole other story. And it's like, I don't want to mm-hmm. do that. I'm just going to enjoy this moment to myself. And mm-hmm. Oh my God, that was, that was gold. Twitter gold right there. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out JD. Now we, I think we, What's funny is the the biggest debates I've had with JD in the past were Tibbs isn't playing player X long enough, you know, Mm -hmm. and this year, the season started as Tibbs isn't playing pick a player X long enough. And to your point earlier about how like quickly and and RJ are are doing well out in out in Toronto. And I can think RJ is the thing that's kind of maybe not necessarily surprised all of us, but him becoming like a really efficient player out there was like always the issue here and you just Mm -hmm. wonder if he was just miscast as you know a guy that should be off ball I think he's just flatly hitting shots and his three point shot is the thing that I'm curious if it stays next season because that's going to have a lot to do with that effective field goal percentage staying that high but it's almost I don't know how you feel about this and how like the reputation Tibbs has had throughout the, the league and like I'm getting people on, on when I talk to to people outside of New York, it's like, yeah, that's it, it. Seems like you guys found the coach you've been waiting for, and like they the team has taken on his identity. And I agree with that. How we got there was a rocky road of like not playing quickly at the two. But Deuce McBride, you're more than welcome to play at the two. I'm not going right. to play three guards together. But hey, Dante Vincenzo. Um and like Steve Jones, we're not gonna go small, but now we go small almost now, damn near all the time. Quite literally, look, we're spreading the floor. Oh, what do you know? There's there's Warriors split action oh, being put man. into the offense, and like, look, I appreciate that, like the tenacity that this team used to would played with throughout the first three years, and that was always like a base level floor that we all thought he gave the team, mm-hmm. and now, and Steve Jones said something really smart on our show the other day that because he's got the personnel. He's willing to try new stuff and try new things. And maybe really that all it was going to take is that, oh, I feel comfortable with this. I know I can go back to the base level principles that I care about. But now that Dante's now Clay Thompson, I can I can experiment a little bit now with a three guard lineup or OG positionless basketball with OG and Josh Hart switching at the four and the three. And I don't know. It's it's just it's the most confident I've been in a Knicks head coach ever. Let alone like like this version of Tibbs. I think it's the best coaching job he's done of his career, and it's why I'm actually like, very curious going into the playoffs. Like what like what's the floor I should put on this team? You know, I know they might draw they might draw Philly, but just speaking to Tibbs on that side of things, what's your what's your vantage point? Your perspective been of that this season? Tom Thibodeau, like as a as a coach, like the, yeah, the yeah. Season. Like, I guess, like it's tough because I always knew that he needed his guys, right? And it's like I always thought he had his guys to a certain degree. Even with quickly, it's he, he's a Tibbs guy. He plays tough defense and he can score. Why not give him more opportunities, especially at the beginning of this season where it just felt like. I, I I know that managing minutes for everybody because we had a plethora of guards to begin this year was difficult, but quickly demonstrated more than enough that he was second in six man of the year voting. He should be given that leeway to say, hey, you know, if I got to go rely on anybody, it's quickly because I know he can play defense and I know he can get me a bucket and I know he can score adequately. He's not a lethal three-level score, but adequately, adequately at three levels. So, I was always a little taken aback why he didn't give quickly the 
the runway that he deserved. RJ, I could be a little more understanding because what he wanted RJ to be was never what RJ was going to be. The reason why RJ, like to me, is why he's successful in Toronto is because he gets to be like what Randall is for the Knicks. He gets to be mm-hmm. on ball most of the time. He gets to be that battering ram and attack downhill. And, you know, he's a guy that needs to feel the basketball in order to get rhythm. And the more use, the higher the usage, the better it is for him. And the greener the light, the better he is. And you just see it like his shot just looks more fluid. Like I don't tap in the Raptors game that frequently, but when I have, it's like, oh, RJ looks very comfortable and it looks like he's given that confidence to go out there and go be who he is. And I think when you just watch Tibbs, what he had with the roster last season, it was too much of a cookie cutter of what he wanted instead of just leaning in. And that's my gripe is that sometimes he doesn't lean into who these players are naturally. And he's like, I would need you to fit what I need. Instead of saying, I see what your strengths are. Let's work with your strengths and see how we can incorporate it into this system. So with that being said, I always knew he, he needed his guys. I was And I always say this on every, I was like, how many people do you know? How many coaches do you know in this league that say, that's a Tibbs guy? Or like, that's mm-hmm. a coach's guy, right? It's it, like, even when you say that's a Popovich guy, it's not necessarily that's a Popovich guy. He just fits Popovich's system. There is Tibbs guys, meaning they need to be playing a certain brand of basketball, a certain way in order to fit what he needs. Now, I wouldn't say that Brunson is necessarily a Tibbs guy. I wouldn't necessarily say Randall is a Tibbs guy. They're just both great isolation scores, and you can now fill out the rest of it with Tibbs guys, guys who are gritty, who will play 110% effort, who will play defense, who will do what they need to do in order to stay on the court and, and earn their money and earn their minutes. That's what everybody else is on that roster to, is to me. Like Precious, McBride, all those guys, those are all Tibbs guys by the way that they go out there and hustle. <clears throat> but it was just kind of, to me, like I knew that. I just didn't know where these guys were going to be. I, you, I, I didn't believe Precious could be a Tibbs guy, but he is a Tibbs guy. You know, knew Josh Hart would be. Um, I guess, uh, did I know Dante would be? I just knew Dante was a smart player. So I figured like he could just acquiesce to the system. But everybody else, like Mitch is like the rim protector that Tibbs is probably dreaming of. Isaiah Arnstein, how he's playing now, loves it. You know, you had a Joe Kim Noah, a guy who could be a passing mm-hmm. big. Now you have that in your starting rotation. So it's just kind of fit in. I guess to throw it back at you, though, like, did you did you recognize that? Did you see that? Like, these are like, he just needed his guys. And like, or did you say, did you see the same thing I'm saying? Like, guys had to acquiesce to be who Tibbs wanted them to be versus him finding his own guys that he trusted. I think the 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 conflict that I have personally with like like the back and forth I keep making is I agree with you 100% about quickly like the the point we had reached to we had reached at the end of right 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 before the trade because you remember that OKC game where he subbed quickly out they were making a comeback because quickly was on the floor and anytime he had that unit on the floor with Josh Hart at the 3 and quickly at the 2 it was like it was as good as the OG lineups that are now. And it's like, you had a super lineup out there. And every time I would read that to a, a pregame podcast, they were like, Oh my God, that's insane. He should probably be starting. Um, but like we had reached such a point of frustration in managing the minutes that I agree. Like quickly wasn't given the, the long enough leash. It's just then tough on the other side of the trade to see like, Oh, but because of the quickly trade, like, Dante DiVincenzo became the greatest three-point shooter in Knicks history. Right. And like we got to see Deuce McBride get some runway and quite literally build a, a role for himself as one of the better value contracts in the sport. You mm-hmm. know, Ananobi being the guy they traded for quickly is his Luol Dang, except better, you know, a better shooter, mm-hmm. a more impactful defender. And like, yes, he probably always needed his guys. And I just, I, I the, the the Knicks have more patience than I do, clearly. But like you hear the quotes <laughs> out of And that's why the front office is great, Andrew. <laughs> right. Like they have but like to all the tip stuff too. Like you the, when you listen to roommates and you hear like Josh Hart being interrupted by a call from Tibbs, like he right. he clearly has a roster that he always needed, which is why he's willing to experiment. And I th- there's a transition to a, another conversation about Julius that I, I think we can have that is he oh, also boy being willing to experiment because he has a roster that doesn't have a guy that is unable to play in a heavy motion, heavy ball movement 
style offense. Like Julius, I think he's he gets more shit than he should from Knicks fans. But like you mentioned that the redundancy of RJ and Julius probably had run its course and quickly was going to be a great sixth man, but not necessarily be what he could become in Toronto because the Knicks had committed to Jalen Brunson. And like since since quickly left, like Jalen Brunson, not it's not cause and effect, but Jalen Brunson's just like been the only source of point guard play that we've had consistently and has become an MVP candidate as mm-hmm. a result. So like as a result, I'm wondering if not just eliminating I'll say RJ, because I think like you I agree, quickly was a Tibbs guy, but they've found other ways to find Tibbs guys like Dante and Deuce and and other guys at the two and at the wing to fill that void. So this team looks amazing without Julius Randle. And it's so conflicting. Like with uh, it's oh, so conflicting, God, man. man. This team looks amazing. Come on. Julius Randall. I listen, I defend the guy all the time. I hate when people say like there's this stupid Ewing theory that I, I I'm still upset that the Bill Simmons I, Ewing theory, the Ewing yeah, theory that me, Simmons cre- uh, the first yeah, of all, give me a break you, on that. <laughs> the the Ewing theory being created because he had a Knicks fan in his life, which all the worst conversations on his show start with. I have Knicks fans in my life. Dot dot dot. Like I, yeah, I'm I have sorry, a lot of Knicks fans in my life, and uh, yeah, and like, then okay, they okay, all hate. They all you. self-loathing, self yeah, self-loathing uh, Knicks fans. Like, maybe you got to change the Knicks fans you're hanging out with, bud, or you're just making them up. <laughs> well, so like that Knicks fan hated on Patrick Ewing for a decade, and then chose like after they had tied the series one-one against the Pacers, and he hurt his Achilles, right? Right. So they won three more games against the Pacers team that was kind of fraudulent. Let's all just have an honest moment, Knicks fans. Got the benefit of a phantom foul in game three that led to the four-point play that we all hail as legendary. And then looked overmatched, undersized. Probably needed a Hall of Fame center out there against the San Antonio Spurs. You know? Like, how is that the Ewing theory? The Bledsoe theory is what you should go to. It won your team a Super Bowl, Bill. But the point being, the, the theory that a guy that you've depended on for so long, once you release him or get, or once he's not in the picture, you know, the team does better. Um, that's the whole concept of the Ewing theory. And as much as I still believe that they're going to struggle at one point, they're going to hit a ceiling because they don't have Randall. I understand that people are watching this heavy motion, a lot of ball movement, a lot of creativity, a lot of Jalen Brunson in this offense at the moment mm-hmm. and are, are very much enjoying the product that they're seeing. Um, I don't know how you feel and how how the the Knicks Nation over on your side of the the fence feels, but like, what has the reaction to how they've looked without Randall been? You get both sides of the spectrum, man. You get like, oh, we don't need Randall. We'll trade Randall. He hasn't done anything in the playoffs. Da 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 da. And then you have the other side, like, yo, don't disrespect Randall. Like, we still need him. And I'm on the side of like, you still need Randall. Like, at the end of the day, when you go back to the playoffs against the Cavs, the Heat last season, because he was on the floor, even though he wasn't 100% healthy, you still have to honor a guy that in single coverage can still get a bucket. So because of that, you know, it still opened up stuff for Jalen Brunson to operate. Now, the development that we've seen here is that Brunson's just a superstar. So doesn't matter who's doesn't matter if it's Jalen Brown, doesn't matter if it's Jason Tatum, doesn't matter if he's double, doesn't matter if you get a blitz, he will still figure it out, get to his spot, and still get his points, which is why he's better than Jason Tatum. But that's another story. So anyway, when you look at how just Brunson is able to do it, and this is the, I guess, the after effect that you know everyone's looking at is that wow, Brunson's really a superstar. You can't stop this guy. Maybe we got to figure out some another way to like make sure that this guy continues to have the rock in his hand. Or do we have to look for another guy on that four that can do the same thing? And while it is nice to see that Brunson has now like elevating to the superstardom, right? And I think he's a superstar. I think he he belongs in the top five MVP conversation. I know we're going to discuss that. But I I do look at him and I do look at this absence of Julius being great for Brunson because as an organization, you can now say, wow, this guy is really talented. Wow, this guy has reached another level. Wow. Uh, we have a superstar in house. You know, we don't have to go hardcore searching to look for a Giannis or for an Embiid. We have this guy right here who, as of right now, is pretty unstoppable. And because of that, 
we can now, we're now in the driver's seat saying we don't have to be desperate. Do we have to get another guy potentially to add to this roster to make his life easier? 100%. I'm not saying that we should, we, that we're, we're here, we're fine, we're okay with how the roster is constructed. That has been the aftermath of fine, of not having Julius, but I'm not delusional in the sense of like, you still need Julius. You're going to need at some point, if you're, if you were going against Boston in a seven game series, I still think this team would make it tough on Boston. They're not going out like no punks. But if you had Julius, another guy that they had to honor offensively, that's a bit that's a better challenge. That that's that's two heavyweights going at it, right? That but we and we don't have that. So I look at Julius as like you still need him for this team. And it's infuriating he can be sometimes. The decision making at times can be a little bit questionable, but he is a legit guy who gives you a lot on the defensive end when it comes to rebounding. He's a legitimate isolation scorer at this point. And the difference about this season than years past is that he's not being that jump shooter, right? He's getting downhill. He's getting into the paint. He's working the post, which is his brand of basketball. And it's the best he's ever looked in a Knicks uniform in what would have been his third All-NBA season, in my opinion, just because he's playing that great, right? He's already an All-Star, three-time All-Star on the Knicks. He would have been All-NBA by the way he was playing, in my opinion. And, and because of that, when you see that, I'm more, I could give him that leeway saying, okay, if this is the Julius that we're going to have and not the jump shooter, this is doable. This is doable. Now you talk about, is somebody else on this roster going to take a next step up? Like, is that going to happen? Would it be, I know you joked about Dante being Clay. Does Dante become a better score? Is he going to be like outside of just three point shooting? Could be, you know, incorporate more of a three level game to himself. Maybe that's something. Do you go out and go get someone like Donovan to add to this? Maybe, but the Knicks are in the driver's seat at this point, but you still need Julius. Like, there's no question about it. And so I'm not saying throw Julius. I would love to see him healthy next season. Maybe this is just like a blessing in disguise where he doesn't start next season at the beginning. He comes back midway through, has more of a rest, and he looks fresh. I don't know if you saw this last season or not, Andrew. But when the Celtics, when that Nick Celtics game wins a double OT, Randall wasn't the same. Yeah. He, he just looked exhausted. He looked done, like, and not done in the sense like he was done with the season, but he just looked like gassed. It, he gassed, like, wow, this season is really taking a toll on me because he likes to play all 82 games if possible. And for that, for a guy who likes to play so many games, and if you can't tell him no, maybe sometimes you need something to tell you no. So that way you could be healthy and well rested. And that's where you look at somebody like Jokic who took some time off before the playoffs. I'm looking at beat and B this season to see how good he is for the playoffs because he's had some time to rest as well and get healthy. This is where I'm like, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. I'm, I'm, I don't want to think too far ahead because I'm enjoying what the Knicks are doing right now. But part of me is like, I can't wait until next year to see if this team's fully healthy. If Randall got the rest that he needed, if he's able to turn it up and maybe it's another way to say for Thibodeau, Hey, maybe we should think about resting some guys some nights, you know, and like well, be able to pick and choose. <laughs> that's that's unfortunately not in the, 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 his the, DNA. I know it's just like, but like I feel like that's ingrained in the team at this point. Like Josh jokes around about like, oh, I got to play all these minutes tonight, but like I feel like they're all ready to play. Like that's part of the base level competence. Like I don't think, I think actually this is part of doing pregame pods this year that I recognize that that's like just a Knicks thing, but it's built into the DNA. Like when I was talking to the guys over at the chase down after, after the Knicks won that game, when Brunson got hurt in the first, first minute. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we had, the Knicks had no answer for Sam Merrill. Why do you think they took him out of the game midway through the fourth quarter for like that four minute stretch? That's how the Knicks were able to get back in the game and take the lead was during that stretch. Cause you put in a, a lesser player. And the response is like, well, he was at the very end of a long shift and needed a breather. And then he came back in for the three minutes. And it just, I, it clicked like, oh, that's right. Other teams have long shifts. Like they they, they, they need breathers. And mm-hmm. this team, the team we root for, it's a, can you, can you walk? Yeah. Okay. You're playing. Like if, <laughs> if the medical staff tells me you need a minutes restriction, I'll honor it, which is what we've seen from OG and Hartenstein and Brunson. But Josh, you have no minutes limit. Fine. You're playing 46, 47 minutes. Deuce, you, you're good? Okay. You're playing 46, 47 well, minutes. Uh, in fairness to Deuce, I mean, he's been sitting for quite some time for the last couple of years. So, so I, 
I would hope he's, that he has enough. He's life, available, like, yes, yes, but like to to the point that you need to be ready to do that because there's no such thing as a as a long shift and needing a breather with the Knicks. Like we saw it with the old version of this team. How many times did it quickly just come into the game with four minutes, five minutes left in the set, in the third quarter, and he's in for the rest of the game? Like that was yeah. part of the like Josh Hart became that player too last season, and like okay, they'll come in late in the game and they'll close with the team. That's that's just part of the the fabric, and I it, it's why going into the playoffs, I've thought about how gassed they are, but I actually seem like you're a fan of it. <laughs> well, it's like I'm 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 wondering if like it was out of necessity because he just was not playing these Pistons any any minutes, you know? Like I'm 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 a fan of winning, which is what the what they've been doing. So I don't think they're gonna win 50 games if he doesn't do that, and we're actually trying to make like a a a, a modern other like a, a Cleveland version of uh, the rotation work, but I think we're also finishing behind Cleveland if we we don't make it work. So it's why like to bring this all the way back around to Tibbs. Look, what I have like played Shake Milton and Daquan Jeffries and Jericho Sims in the fourth quarter up thirty against Boston. Yes, but that was also an eight point game with like two minutes left. So I. His paranoia, as much as I can very easily diagnose it about like garbage time, like, I think that's really the only time I get upset with minutes is the paranoia. And I'm sensitive to people that were like, all right, guys are dropping like flies. We need to use more caution with the healthy ver- players on this team. But man, they just across the board of a, you talk about Tibbs guys, they've all adopted his identity and his intensity. And like we can, we can talk about the playoffs now because while I agree, I, I think there's a ceiling without Julius, but like I don't like I echo what John said the other night. I don't think they're gonna lose because like they ran out of gas or they f- or or they beat themselves. They'll lose because another team beat them, you know, because Embiid was unstoppable because the Celtics have beat everybody this year. I don't think they'll lose because like like Miami. I thought they played poorly last year. I didn't necessarily think that Miami like overmatched the Knicks. Jimmy Butler was hobbling for five games of that series. I thought yeah, like Gabe the, Vincent and Cody Martin just playing out. Max Strews. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were just playing. They were playing at a level that that's unsustainable for them. I mean, we see it this season. Right? Yeah. Like, Dude, Caleb Martin was playing so, so well that you called him Cody. And like, that's how interchangeable he just was. That <laughs> Like he, 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 we thought his brother was playing necessarily. Right. We we're like, wait, like, one of the Martin twins is going to get us out of here. And right. I think Celtics fans have have felt the same way. Um, I don't think that's going to happen this year. And uh, I think that's what a lot of people then point to the Julius conversation that, well, yeah, you don't have Julius, a known underperformer in the playoffs. Um, and I, I would say there's a, <clears throat> there's a nuanced conversation to have there. Uh, but I, I don't know. I just have, I have so much confidence in at least the, the disciplined, competent version of this basketball team that I'm at least going to be proud of this team whenever, if they get, I'm going to say if, if they get eliminated this year, you know, Um, the only only way they're eliminated, Andrew, is if, if the other team is just overpowering, as you said, yeah, they're not going to beat themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And if that happens, that happens. And then you see how much you just need talent on this roster at the end of the day. Like, Part of it is talent. Part of it is coaching and execution. Like we've seen that. I think you look at last year and you can see that execute. Like I believe having a solid head coach like Eric Spolster makes a huge difference. Like he's a motivator of men. He obviously knows his X's and O's. Like you need somebody like that on your bench, but you also need guys to be playing ta- like who have talent to do so. Right. Like those guys who were going off for Miami last year, like they were playing at a talent level that was above their punching weight and obviously was not sustainable once they met the Denver Nuggets in the finals. So look, the Knicks there for the Knicks, man, it's possible for them to do the same thing. It's possible for them to get hot. I mean, we've seen Dante knock down eight threes and go eight of 12. And if you have something like that, plus Josh Hart uh, going like what to say like eight, eight of 10, just because he's getting a lot of transition scoring and grabbing you 12 rebounds getting you like eight assists because he's being a playmaker too. That's huge. If you allow Brunson to be Brunson, you have a great chance to win a series that way. The question is how long is that, is that sustainable, right? For the Knicks, because they'd be doing what they do. Like I said, like Miami did, which is punching above their weight for a little bit. Like 
the fact that we only have one guy that can create for themselves in Brunson, that's the only thing that's holding me back saying this team is just like a world beater, right? You just need a little bit more of those. So talk me through your playoff expectations then. That I agree. They they will need someone else that can create for themselves. And like the other part that's been really cool with with Tibbs in this offense is like the way they're creating looks with like it's it's almost like a, a Shanahan type of thing where I never thought like we'll take this to football. I never thought any of the offensive coordinators that Peyton Manning had, like we actually suffered from it because yes. we had Adam Gase as our head coach because he stood next to Peyton Manning. And they're like, oh, gotta be an offensive genius. Peyton Manning endorses him. Like, yeah, Pey- Peyton Manning was the was the offensive genius. Even like like Hackett this past off season was like, yeah, anybody gets look great next to next to Aaron Rodgers, you know, I, I, it's the Shanahan's of the world or the McVeigh's of the world that make Brock Purdy and Jared mm-hmm. Goff and scheme guys open. And I think Tibbs is, I think it's just been a, a love fest the last like month or so watching him scheme guys open and the different, different looks that they've been getting that I'm curious over a five game series, how you potentially um, are able to battle a team that can game plan against the, what the Knicks are doing, because like you said, they really only have one creator in Brunson. So like what are the teams that you think will give the Knicks trouble? And uh, we should just say like, it looks like they're headed for a first round matchup with Philly. So let's just like cut to the chase. How are you feeling about a first round matchup with Philly? I mean, I'm ready for, I'm ready for the matchup. I mean, uh, you can't pick and choose who you go to battle, but I do think the Knicks would give them a tough time. Um, the one thing that gives me a little solace against the Sixers is that, unlike the Heat, and we in CP and shout out to our guy Andrew, uh, the AK Andrew Solop, aka the one-two combo on uh, on the NBA report w- that we did today, is that when you think about Miami, they're like that Shanahan where they're constantly running motion, and so if you're thinking about, are you guys ready to run around chase? players for 48 minutes. If they're not ready to do that, Miami's just going to be a tough matchup, right? We saw that last year. Philly, while they can do that, they really just like to dump it to Joel Embiid or give it to Tyrese Maxey to go do the damn thing. Mm-hmm. And so for that, if you're going to be a little bit more stagnant, it gives guys on defense a little bit more time to breathe. There's a little bit more standing around. If you're doing that, you can throw OG at Embiid. And as we saw in that first matchup, when, er- when both teams were fully healthy, like Embiid shot a little under 50% from the field. And that's where you had Randall go one for 11 from the field. You didn't have necessarily a great game from OG. You, you, you know, you had Grimes, McBride, Brunson, all of them were, and Josh were all doing like their bit, like doing their jobs. So it's like, okay, if that's the case and you have Embiid still out there, that's pretty good, man. Like you, I, I can believe in this match. I can believe in this series. Right. Yeah. So, and it's not saying they would, they would easily cakewalk Philly. That's going to be a battle. Like you're talking about a guy who's playing at an MVP level, so it's going to be tough to stop him. But yeah. based on that play style, where it's a little bit slower, I think that fits into the Knicks' favor rather than not saying they would have a like a difficult time with Miami. But Miami, you can't you can't make any mistakes. That's the only thing. Like if you make a mistake you potentially lose that game. It could just be one mistake because Miami's not going to, we talk about the Knicks not beating themselves. Miami doesn't really beat themselves. And yeah. that's where you have to go in there playing a perfect game. So for Philly, they're not necessarily the perfect, they're not perfect, but I'm not terribly worried, but it will be a challenge. How do you feel about it? I know you, I know you say that. And when we spoke way back, back when I was doing Nick Shets, et cetera, you wanted the heat over the Hawks. You're like, I want the heat. Very different there, team. Is, yes, yes. <laughs> it was a different team, but is there a team right now that you say, I want that matchup? Because look, it seems like we're getting on that collision course that you said for the Sixers, but you know, it could easily be the three seed tomorrow and face the, the Indiana Pacers, you know, and we can go relive those memories. I'm sure the NBA would love for that to happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at Reggie. Look at Ewing. Look at all these guys. Adam Silver is just like, what? let's rake the money in. He's, he's shaking wads of cash. For saying mm-hmm. we can make something back. Um, is there a team that you really want, or, or are you just focus on Philly right now? Well, so if we're talking like ideal matchups, it's like give me the Orlando Magic, which is still in play at that, the seven eight. Yeah, that like, is still in play. Yeah. Um, I think I think where I've come around to it, and I've tried to balance 
like blind arrogance because of how confident I am in this team with nuanced analysis of other teams, you know, like, like I think Miami kind of hit lightning in a bottle last year. I do respect that team. I do want to give them the, um, the kudos of being the East reigning champs and a team that's I been there. The in your eyes seeing that. I just like last year took it out of me. Like I went into that <laughs> after that Cav series being like, oh my gosh, I, I was Why is Josh it. Hart starting? He is right. Like why, why is Grimes on the bench and then Grimes plays and it didn't fix anything. And like, why is like, jo- like Max Struess is hitting every three and Caleb Martin's hitting every three. And we're still doubling Jimmy Butler. And I just, I got to a point with that, like one person showed up to help Jalen Brunson in that playoff series last year. And it was RJ for six games or for five games because or really four games because that game three was bad. But like he really only had help in one game. Uh, uh, Excuse me. He only really had one guy helping him outside of, you know, game six where he did it all by himself. Mm. And I'm like really confident that's not going to happen this year, regardless of who they play. As far as the matchups are concerned, Jimmy Butler's a great player. Joel Embiid's a better player at this point in his career. And I respect both of them. Those are not super teams. Those are not teams that I should be afraid of. Like, they're going to completely ruin our season. And to your point about the one time they played Philly, that was a great experiment. And I don't take it as the full sample that should give Knicks fans blind confidence. I think what we've experienced as Knicks fans over the past, really this Tibbs era, is the fact that like these playoff series we've played in, we've known by game four who the better team is. And we haven't really had a seven game series where you're like, oh, this is a toss up. I think that's what we're headed for. If it's Philly that Mm. we'll be in game six, but like, I have no idea who's going to win this series. And we might even get to a game seven at the garden, which is why I'd give the Knicks the edge that they have, they've earned home court in that series. Um, But I I think that's where this, this playoffs is going to be a little different. You know where I, I and it helps, and this is where we can kind of kind of wrap up that like what Jalen Brunson has become neutralizes what Joel Embiid is because it used to be we were playing with to Kenny Smith's perspective. I never uh, believed that in this season to begin with. By the way, I didn't believe it either. But to the national perspective, it was like, well, the Knicks aren't going to have the best player on the floor, and this season, I think Jalen Brunson would be the best player in a Miami series. Best play- My God, he would be the best player in an Orlando series. He would, of course, be the best player in an Indiana series. And I think Embiid was headed to a, a one-way ticket to a second straight MVP had he stayed healthy. But it's a... like They're both on the same level. They're both in the same tier. I think Brunson should... Brunson shouldn't finish top five in MVP. He should finish top four in MVP as far as I'm concerned. Um which is why I think having him playing the way he's playing just creates a different ceiling for this team in my mind. Um, and it goes past any like Tibbs conversations or like roster construction or most like offense. We want to say looks better. Like, no, we have a superstar. Like we have a guy playing at an MVP level at the moment that could probably win a series by himself. If, if he plays at that same level. Um, and I, yeah, I, I just, this team's earned that he's earned that. And it's why going into a potential series with Philly, I'm not going to just be like, Oh, Knicks in five. I think the Knicks would win a seven game series against the Sixers because I believe we have a guy playing at an unguardable level at the moment. Um, which is why I turn it back over to you. Is Jalen Brunson enough for you to be like the, the same type of at least confidence. Is that really the source of your confidence? If you have it that like, Hey, JB has been pretty unstoppable for the last, like, really the last three months and all season, but really the last month where he's vaulted himself into the top five MVP conversation. Yeah. I guess to clarify myself and like my, con- and what I was saying earlier about still needing Randall is that, yeah. And talk about, you know, not being afraid about Philadelphia is because Brunson is playing at that level that you talked about, Andrew. And the fact that you can go in there and be like, Oh, we have the best guy. Like we are, we can argue that who's better at this point. Right. And it's a legitimate conversation. Shout out to our guy, Schwinn, who was like, you see, uh, was it uh, Brunson and, and Giannis conversation? Like, oh, Giannis doesn't have a bag, but it's averaging like 30, however many rebounds and assists. And then you look at Brunson, it's like averaging similar numbers. Like, oh, this guy's unguardable. He has a deep bag. And it's mm-hmm. like, shout out to Swingers. Like, oh, we have finally reached Brunson and Giannis conversation. We finally made it. And we have made it. And that, and 
look, the fact that you could talk about Brunson being in the MVP conversation is making it as a Knicks fan. We have a legitimate guy who is unguardable, who, you know, to me, I think honestly should win the MVP. And this is not even like homerism at this point. It's that's right. I saw this take going around. You yeah, think he look, should win it over Jokic, over Luka? You said he's the MVP. You could, I think you could. Look, there's an argument for over Jokic, but I, and there's also an argument for why Jokic should win because my whole standpoint is that if you remove this guy, if you remove that player, he is so valuable that the team crumbles. Jokic, if you remove him from the Nuggets, that team crumbles. They're still competitive, but it's not the same dominance and efficiency that you talk about without Jokic because he's that engine. You know, there's some games that Luka Mitch misses. But Kyrie can still do an effective job, but you still need Luka. Luka's a top-tier talent. You take Brunson away from the Knicks, it is god-awful. Like, we've seen that, Andrew. Yeah. How, like, we've seen what it's like to have <laughs> Randall be the only guy out there. We well, saw I'll, that last season. I'll even go to just, like, this season. Like, the whole thing for the last two months has been how will they survive the non-Brunson minutes, you know? And, 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 and he's still... That playing. is his MVP case, you know? And you look at when we play the Celtics and he's gone for the entire fourth quarter and you play that second unit and you're like, wait a minute, the, the, that bench unit's making a comeback. Peyton Pritchard, he's starting to knock down shots and McBride is having a tough time organizing the offense. You're, 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 tr- you're struggling to find out, trying to figure out who can get to their spot and get a bucket. That's where Brunson comes in and it's the only guy who can do that. And, and yet at the same time, when he's in there, he is unguardable. He is putting up crazy numbers. He is crazy efficient at this point. And the fact that you have him, like you need him. You need him. And the fact that he's doing it against top end teams, like and what feels like almost by himself to a degree. Yeah, he has help. Yeah, but on nights, you don't know who else is going to provide that offense. And so you need these 40 point outings by Brunson. And if that's the case, that's MVP to me. So if he he should win based on what the Knicks have had to go through, you don't have Julius for the mo- for the rest of the season. You lose him in January. You lose him January twenty eighth. Mitch missed about fifty games, if not fifty. OG missed some time after being traded to this team. So you don't have your top three. You don't have your top three guys. All three starters, by the way. And you you put together a roster where it's like, all right, we got Brunson, and you know it's like you know who this reminds me of, Minnesota Vikings with Adrian. Peterson. And it's mm. like, all right, just hand the ball off to him. This guy's legit. You know, we could stay in games even with this guy. That's how he feels to me right now. Okay. And so that's my, that's my case for why he should be MVP because after everything that you had to go through, it's all the injuries, man. And the Knicks have the opportunity to be the second seed in the Eastern conference. Like that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Like that that's MVP type level stuff right there. So the two seed 50 wins, like, and like to your point about like what he's meant to this team, I think this is really the Jokic case that how many players he makes better. I compared him to Coors Field the other mm-hmm. day on a pod that like, like Aaron Gordon, I think is a great basketball player. I'd love to see what his numbers are not in Denver because those are course field numbers. Like those are mm-hmm. inflated because you're playing with Jokic and that's just how much better he makes the anybody around him. And you see it when he leaves the court as well. Brunson, like we've seen it, like even Chenzo has more gravity or more freedom but because of Brunson's gravity. You see that even Chenzo's open and is able to hit threes and Josh Hart, especially when they double uh, Brunson and those, especially what the Kings were doing, which was still hilarious to this day. Like Josh Hart's getting 30 points because he's just playing four on three. And like Hartenstein, that's actually, you're giving Isaiah Hartenstein, like a low, low key, a quarterback of his own, uh, the ability to play four on three if you're doubling Brunson. Um, like what Deuce McBride's been able to do, what all these other players have been able to do because Brunson commands so much attention. And I, I think that's why, like, that's your MVP case. And I, Look, I'm not going to go as far. I I love the, I love the energy. I'll say that much. I love the take, and I I think that's a what he's earned this year is like he should be the MVP conversations, which is why if he ends up missing top five in either first team NBA or uh, if he doesn't make top MVP, five, I'll be, I'll, I'll be pretty upset to be honest. I'll be I'm at that point too. Yeah, because look, I I don't understand the Tatum love so much where he's on the best team and like. 
I, I just like I, I don't get it. You're because, surrounded by it too because you're up in Boston, so I'm sure you you run into it. More the real ones know that it's JB, and the other everyone just likes to go with Tatum. That's okay. yeah, like I know like everyone people are like yo JB showed up when he came to playing. When you the say Warriors. JB, you mean Jalen Brown, right? Not Jalen Brown. Yeah, okay, yeah, just yeah, making Jaylen sure. Brown. Yeah, Jalen Brown. Yeah, because like they're they're like oh Jalen Brown showed up like again, and where was Tatum? You know, and then it's like. I hear you, man. I like Jalen Brown too because I, he has that mentality where it's like he's a dog. You know, he mm. doesn't like shy away from the light. Um, I, I for Tatum, like I get that he's very talented as a deep bag, as you know, all the hip kids would say. <laughs> uh, but look, at the end of the day, he's surrounded by like the best players, and this is like the argument for like why I would put Brunson over SGA. Jalen Williams is playing at all you know, at, at a top tier level, Chet, his return is awesome. Right. I mean, that team has a lot of talent where SGA, absolutely the engine. There's no question about it. I mean, he's put up 30 points every single night, very important to that team for what they're doing, but he has talent around him for them to be in that position. I look at like, I'm like for that argument, cause we had that discussion too on KFTV. I'm like, cause Stephen A was talking about, it, I'm like, I still go with Brunson because of what Brunson's had to do with less. Like SGA has had a pretty healthy team for most of the season. I would like to see what he does with out all those team members every single time. I mean, we got a glimpse last season. Granted, they were, they were all still developing, but I'd like to see what happens when he doesn't have Chet, when he doesn't have Jalen Williams. So like, can he still do the same thing and carry that team in a tough Western conference? So, so yeah. SGA is about to be, like the best player on a one seed in the West, like a 57 win one seed in the mm -hmm. West. So it's the only argument. I mean, it's not the only argument. I think there's a defensive side of the ball that SGA. Is oh, for sure. No, no, no. That, and you can incorporate all those things too. Yeah. I'm yeah. not saying, I'm not saying he's not talented. I'm saying like, I guess the thing is, and this is what's so tough with the MVP mm -hmm. conversation is you have to nitpick margins. I agree with you. 100%. It's, it's, it's yeah. nitpicking margins, but are you talking about, overall production on the individual player or are you talking about the actual importance of the player to the team? And I lean yeah. more towards the team than the overall statistics because statistically and talent wise, I probably would lean SGA more than Brunson because he can play defense. He's still a playmaker. He can still score and still impacts winning. But if you're telling me the importance of the player to the team, and this is not saying SGA is not important. I'm just saying if you're going with the story, the narrative of what this award also is, it's based on narrative. Okay. Then what Brunson has done then is much more impressive than what SGA has had to go through this season Yeah. now, but he still has the case like worst to first. And so that also helps his ca case. And like I said, I'm not saying SGA is a scrub, I'm not saying any of that. No, I get I'm just it. saying, no, because I know what people are going to do in the comment page. I know what they're all going to do. Like, oh, you, you don't we want both live that comment section all. life. No, no, yeah. No. Yeah, all gonna cry. Yeah. I get it, but I'm just saying. I look, I trace. I thought going, he needs to be top four was was that was hot for me, you know. So I, it's why I can respect that you're like, no, he's one, and like say say it with your chest that I that I appreciate. I think. So will you be disappointed if he, like, what's what's the disappointing MVP announcement for you? Out of that five. he finished he's out of five? five. Okay. If he's not top five. That's me too. That's me too. If he's not if top five. he's not five. top five, and if I see Tatum on that list, I'm going to be very disappointed because that is truly, we're truly just glazing over the fact of like, oh, well, Tatum's on like the best team. It's yeah. like, yeah, no, duh. I mean, look at that. It's a historic starting lineup that he's got. I was about to say, my, well, so the funny thing is I, there's historical precedent for this too, that like in, in Brunson's favor, the 2017 Warriors, arguably the best regular season, best overall team we've ever seen. Steph Curry was the highest to finish an MVP that year, and it was sixth. And a small guard that led his team to 50 wins in the Eastern Conference, named Isaiah Thomas, finished fifth in MVP that year. And I think Brunson's better than Isaiah overall, but Isaiah Thomas, if you're going by EPM, had the highest offensive EPM in the sport that year. Which is why I go to, to Brunson being like, there's only two guys that are above Brunson that are eligible for MVP and offensive EPM. If you, if you, whatever stock you take in that stat and it's Jokic and Doncic. And I like Jokic, I think that they just, again, it's course field and Luca. I, look, I, I'm very curious how the West seedings shake out. Cause if, if Denver drops to three and we could potentially get Luca versus Jokic in the conference finals, I think we will. Um, but 
that's why I, like, I, he's in that conversation. What Brunson's jumped himself into that we're talking about these superstar guys that are perennial all in first team all NBA yep. guys. Now Jalen Brunson's there now too. That's how. That's what he's been. That's how he's played. That's that's a superstar that we have now. And it's why I don't I don't fear anybody in the playoffs. I'm not like we'll go as far as this team takes us, and it's because we'll go as far as he takes us, which has been pretty damn high at this point. Like they're going to be a two seed if they get help tomorrow, Alex. A two seed after I felt like they've they've played shorthanded for most of this year. And the other guy, and we can really wrap with this. The other guy that is giving me the most confidence. I know you know this number. They're 19 and three with OG Ananobi. Yes. So I'm so I'm supposed to expect that someone's gonna beat the Knicks four times when I've literally not seen them lose a fourth time with OG Ananobi yet. So that's pretty tough. Pretty that's tough my math do. right there. That's literally my math right there. <laughs> is that what is, is that Nick's math? Is that Nick's man math right there? <laughs> that's that's that, this is school. That's the Nick's math class, Nick's film school right there. Okay. Well by my math, they haven't lost a fourth time yet with Ananobi. So I'm supposed to expect to lose a fourth time in a seven game series with Ananobi. He makes you know? a huge difference, man. That's why like any matchup, I mean, between him and Brunson, and I we gotta give OG his respect too. Is like they're both elite on the opposite side of the court. Like OG, top five guy defensively and can cover multiple zi- positions one through five, man. Like that's why when you talk about Philly, it's like, yo, like we're gonna double and beat, and OG's gonna be there and he's gonna be a pest. Mm-hmm. He's gonna make Embiid uncomfortable. You know, going against Miami this season, like I still don't like facing just because every injury we've faced has usually been against Miami. And I'm like, please keep first round. Like, I don't want to see you guys. It's not like, basketball. You, guys keep, you just, you, just, yeah. you, just, you yeah. just keep hurting our guys. And it's just a, like hot kids. I no, don't want to see you. Bam. Don't want to see you. Your illegal mm-hmm. screens and you're, you know, you're grabbing guys arms to pull them from the shoulder and all this stuff. It, 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 I don't, it's not, it's not, it's not what I need right now, Andrew. It's not what I need in the first round. I agree. I want no part well, of Miami, but not even from, I think the Knicks would win that series. I don't know if they'd survive that series is the point. I don't know if they left to go to the second round. With a healthy roster. Exactly. <laughs> and so like, well, it was it now Brunson. It's like, all right, guys, we're going to throw up Brunson. Uh, Nick Here's Juan Jeffries, you ready minutes. to play? <laughs> yeah, you wanted to see Shake Milton minutes, everybody. Here you get him. He's he's healthy enough to play. Good know? Lord, man. Like, I yeah. don't need... I, it's not even being... It's not like... I don't want to see Miami, and uh, it's not like a fear that they... Like, I think they'd be tough. I still think that the Knicks would... You know, they. it's an even matchup, but it's just the injuries, man. It just comes down mm-hmm. to the injuries. There's just something about that team, man. I just don't like them. Never like them. It's just... There's a re- there's a difference between respect, but I do not like them. I just don't. I don't. I do not need yeah. that team. It's not like it's not like the, it's not like the Hawks were just like eh, get out of here. It's like legit like a bird, just like you shoot away like old buck. Eh, no, that's not real. Miami's yeah. real, and it's like I, I don't need any injury. But I would be thrilled if you give me Boston as an NBA fan. I want to know this from you, mm-hmm. Boston Miami first round. I would love to see it. Oh, it. please. It's what I'm for the love for. of God. Boston, Miami first round. Just oh, so for the love of the God. PTSD we're feeling as Knicks fans of like not wanting to play the Heat because there's some historical stuff built in there too, right? Like having to go relive sure. that that stuff. But to see the entire Boston media world and how they've like we mentioned Bill, like Rosillo and all like Mike Sure and Look, I'm all here. these like. I- well, yeah, I'm you're here. in the middle of it. The paranoia I, would, of like, oh my gosh, love, first round, the 60 it. plus win team, we got to play the Heat again. Um, yeah, I'd want to, I'd want to see it. I want, I, I would love, this is how I'd love to, for it to, sorry to cut you off. This is how I'd love for it to play out, Andrew. I would love to see Knicks are up like three, one on the Sixers. And I'm looking at Boston fans like, Hey, how are you doing? We're two and two against Miami. We have no idea how this series is going to go. Jimmy can, has not gone supernova yet. What's going to happen? And I'm like, yep. that sucks, man. And you got you Bam out there. Jimmy be- has that gear, by the way. Do you think he could still get back to, he just has not at all this year. Cause you, you saw like he made all NBA last season. So yep. he just like hasn't shown that at all. When you talk to people in Miami that are serious, like not heat Twitter, but the like serious guys that know ball, they're like, they don't beat good teams. Like that Knicks win is probably their, one of their most impressive wins from two weeks ago. And that was a shorthanded Knicks team that didn't have uh, Ananobi yet. And like, they just, they, the Terry Rozier had hit eight threes, which is like, hasn't happened. Like Jimmy, Jimmy had like 12 points that night. And it's like, can't, does he actually have that gear to go to again? Do you think he does? Andrew, 
It's like believing in Santa Claus. Mm. You need to see it to believe it. As, okay. Uh, one movie I'll believe. Like, I'll believe it doesn't happen. I'll when when it doesn't I see happen. it, when I yep. see it, it's okay. It's like it's like it's like even when who was it? Was it Max Cohen that said uh, Tom Brady was just like Tom Brady's about to fall off a cliff? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, bro, I would love for that to be the case. Let me wait and see. Okay, please. Let's not. Let's not like that. Right be there. So grandiose. Is the- is the most respectful thing we could say about Jimmy Butler. Cause I agree with you. He's entered the Tom Brady discussion, not as like goat territory, no, no, but no, like, no. I'll believe it when it happens. Like I'm not, I'm done predicting yeah, exactly. it. I'm done projecting. I'm not, I'm done saying this is the, no, like I'll believe the Miami heat get eliminated and won't make a, a zombie heat playoff run when they're eliminated and don't make a zombie heat playoff run. Look, man, like he made all NBA last year. They were not taking the regular season seriously. They almost got eliminated in the plan. And the next thing you know, they go on a magical run. So mm-hmm. I need to, once again, I need to see it to believe it. Let them be the A seed. Let them play Boston. I would and love then, for that to happen. Then we don't play them until the, the conference finals in that case. Which, I would love that. I love how we're saying that, that we're like, we wouldn't face them until the conference finals. Yes, this Look, is the man. I mean, the reality is that there's a lot of parody in this league. There's yeah. Lot, like, yeah. Which is, which is fun, which makes it fun, right? Which makes it fun. It may, like, that's why we're so, that's why between Brunson, OG, and just like the pair, it's like, there's so many factors to why, as a Knicks fan right now, it's like you're going to the playoffs and they're like, not nervous. I can't have, this false bravado either but i'm like we got a fighter's chance we 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 can you know we can get past the first round we can go make it yeah. to the second round hey we depending on who the matchup in the second round is we can go make it to the final eastern conference finals but yeah man that's yeah. what i'm at with this team they've earned that they've absolutely earned that that no matter who they face even boston i'm just like yeah that they, that probably the they're probably going to lose this series. They should be picked against in this series. But at every single time, I'm ready to be like, oh, this is the... Like, how many times this year have we looked up and this team has been... Oh, this is the loss. This is the losing streak. Oh, Brunson goes down. Oh, they're going to lose to the Cavs. We oh. lost to the Spurs and the Thunder, Andrew. It was like, ah, this season's done. What this are we doing? Done. Next thing Three you know, we're on a four-game winning streak. We we're go. like, hey, we're back, baby. <laughs> yep. And with, I can, if they get the two seed, I cannot believe this is in play, that they can get the two seed. And, and 50, wins. 50 wins. Yeah. Yeah. So JD um, would be flipping burgers. Yes. <laughs> what is it? Wait, wait, what's that reference to? Oh, so JD has this thing about fit, the 50 burger. So where it's like 50 uh, wins. 50 okay. Burgers. Okay. So there we have it. And uh, shout out to TM, man, our, our, our chief mod in operation over at KFTV. He makes all these great franchise uh, and uh, Discord emoji. So he has JD actually working the grill as one of the emojis. So if you go in there, yeah, they, he's got emojis for like all of our faces where it's like that's you can amazing. See CP, like you can see, uh, you can see me, CK, JD, like we all got emojis in there. It's like, it's so funny. Okay. We don't have fun stuff like that. We have like me jumping on with John to add fun to the broadcast. And like, that's about it. Like <laughs> every now and then, Jeremy's dancing video makes an appearance from, from yes, the broadcast. From, from, when he, <laughs> from when he got caught on the dance cam at MSG, like outside, which always gets a copyright claim, which is like really annoying. But because of the music, because of the uh, oh, the music, the, uh, forget oh, the DJ, to... but because of the music, like it, it, it's why when people are like, why don't you play it so often? It's like, like here's the behind the scenes. Everybody that's been asking for that video throughout the season, like I was tired of cutting it out in post. That's why. That's why we stopped playing it. We'll bring it back for the playoffs. Hopefully, YouTube cooperates. But I was tired of being like, all right, we'll play it. And then here we are in post. I, I have to edit it out anyway because I want this thing to be monetized. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Alex, this was great. And I look forward to hopefully some run-ins during the playoffs where... Uh, our collective brands are successful because the Knicks are successful in the playoffs. And um, man, what a journey it's been that like, I remember hitting you up on Twitter during the pandemic and like you were doing, you were, we, n- neither of us were at our locations where we're at now and we were like doing content. And now here we are in, in this s- space and like we're following this basketball team that just continues to exceed our expectations. And it's just, it's been really cool to, to see where we're both like the tracks that we're both on, you know, man, for sure, man. It's great seeing you grow. I mean, you're now G you're G Mac, you know what I mean? G Mac. So, like, yes. G-Mac. I've become a general manager. Yeah. yeah. man, you're a general Thank manager. You, I was like, wow. Yeah. Like I saw G Mac. I was like, damn, Andrew's become a general manager over there. Damn. Mm-hmm. The, he's got, he's got some serious promotion totally. going on over there. 
totally not a thing that Robert Cross called me one day and it stuck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but no, man, it's been great watching you grow with KFS, man. You've been doing the thing. I mean, I, I tap in, man. I, I know we both tell us, tell each other, we both tap into each other's like programs. Because look, man, like we get ideas. Wait, come on, people. We get ideas from one another. <laughs> the amount like of texts said, we send each other. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, you got this person? You know, what are you, what are you doing for this? Literally. That's okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Yeah. We're more allies than people like to make us out to sit, out to be. Well, so the the where we're the most allies, and we'll we'll wrap here, is when the Jets beat the Giants this year. And I just had mm. to invade that Nick's weekly episode. Um because like I, I waited until you guys were reading super chats at the end, and I had to remind CP that his football team was was whack. Uh, what I didn't realize <laughs> was that was going to be the ceiling of the Jets season because they were going to oh, lose so five straight games afterwards. So bad. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> I but guess... you got you got the Yankees, and Juan Soto looks amazing now. You know. Yeah, man. I mean, look, I have yeah, I'm I haven't tapped into bas- baseball yet. Baseball um, yet? Okay. Just, just because. Knicks. I'm like so focused on that. And because Knicks. Yes. That's Knicks. a lot of my life right now. It's all because Knicks. Knicks. Can't and, uh, and look, what family life outside of that, you know, mm-hmm. having, having, having a son and so forth. So it's tough right now. But once, you know, whenever basketball season is over and the next year, you know, like they, whatever, you know, when they're in the NBA finals and they win the championship and they hold up the trophy and they have you and I up there with them, you know, celebrating because like, Hey, thank you for making sure the fans are engaged. You know, Hell yeah. that'll be all great. <laughs> yeah. The KFS float and the KFTV floats in the parade. Yo, how gonna, crazy would that be? going to go hard. Uh, listen, the way <laughs> CP operates, I'm not surprised if it happens at this point. That man. Talk about you guys too. Come on. You no, no, I'm saying, uh, we would make the effort for it. I'm just saying like, this is my respect for CP that like the foresight, I would be surprised if he's already hit up the mayor now. So like, hey, Mr. Adams, like, I'm just letting you know we're, we're ready. We've, we've got the capacity already, but um, you know, hopefully I, I wish you and the crew over at Knicks fan TV, a very fun and successful playoff run that I hope we all get to enjoy, you know, a couple rounds of this, this, this team, you know, and right back at you, man, you Benji, Macri, uh, Jeremy, uh, Chris, all you guys do phenomenal work, man. All you guys do phenomenal work. Uh, the entire KFS crew does phenomenal work, man. And you guys are like, I learn a lot. Let's just say I learn a lot. Ah. You know what's funny is like I was doing taxes and I'm like, you know, thinking of like Rydals. I'm like, oh, there's the KFS subscription. There it is. Uh-huh. I was like, there we uh-huh. go. Boom. <laughs> There you go. Uh, thank you, Alex, as always, for, for for joining me. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in for another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. Uh, it's been a blast doing this show all season. I've got some stuff in the works for the preseason. Excuse me, not the preseason, the playoffs, because we've got postseason basketball to enjoy. Obviously, I don't know the Knicks opponent yet. So I've, I've thrown some... Uh, listen, Alex, I'm sure you can feel this pain. Uh, we have no idea how to plan for next week yet because we have no Bro, idea who the Knicks are playing like- yet. <laughs> Yo, the feelers hey. I've put out, it's like, hey, I have no idea if this is going to happen, but if it does, because we might have to wait till a playing game is played before we even know. So, um, this is yeah. where it's like, it's so tough. Like, I'm the sending agita. out emails. I sent out emails today. I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. you want to do this? Hey, can you do this? What's, what's going on over here? So, it's like, and it's not, you're not reaching out to one person for one team, right? You're sending out like a couple, you're, Why because, net? yeah, it's, you're, which is, as we discussed through text, the difficulty at times when you're like, hey, you free? And it's like, yeah. 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 The, the worst is the out of markets that where you haven't established a relationship yet. Like my my guys in Orlando, the sixth man show. I know there's like four of them I could hit up for a Knicks Magic matchup. We've both talked to Caitlin Cooper. I actually like there was one where it's like, oh, she's doing Knicks fan TV for this one. OK, great. I'll try to hit her up for the next one. And then you, you try and find other blue wire has been helpful with this. You know, that's great. Yes. Like finding a Timberwolves person or a jazz person or a friggin' like there's like two Kings people out there that are great. Like they, when they've gotten them, they're great. But like these other markets that don't have like in New York, 17 people doing a podcast. 17. Discuss, <laughs> like I, I just like, oh, there's this one podcast in Utah that covers the jazz. Great. You know? Yeah, so, you gotta the, go look for the their, pain uh, of planning yeah. podcasts. <laughs> you wanna know it's a t- you, you know it's funny and, and shout out to my guy um shout out to my guy Brad down in Atlanta. Uh mm. Hawks. Very difficult. Locked to find on Hawks, Hawks, yeah. Well, so the yeah. tough part is Hawks fan TV is always game, but it's Hawks fan TV. Like shout out Alex. I think he's a good person, but I know how Knicks fans feel about him. So 
it's tough to be like, yeah, we'll bring you on, even though you're kind of a heel. And this is like bringing this version of The Rock or Roman Reigns on for an episode, you know? Finally! <laughs> Finally, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, Alex, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, if you dig the show, please head over to iTunes, drop a five-star rating and a review. If for some reason you're not subscribed to Nick's Fan TV and you're watching this, head on over there, give them a five-star rating and a review on their pod, and of course, subscribe to their channel, which is like... Get, get, they're closer to 100,000 than they are to zero at this point. Um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. It's been a fun season. We'll see you in the playoffs. Until next time, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the game on Sunday, and I'll speak with you soon. Peace. <laughs>